inviting your class or giving up part of your class to have Dr. Kellogg here speak today. My name is Mike Ma. I'm an instructor here at Common Polytechnic University. I have to say that. I hope I have to say that. I'm not used to speaking at other places where you have to say Kwantlen Polytechnic University uh, and not Kwantlen College, right? Um, so I'm also a member of the Social Justice Center, and that's a, a small center of, if you will, like-minded colleagues and instructors and staff and students who work on social justice things or social justice activities here. And one of the things that we're working on is um, prison, prison justice, and so that's why uh, I work with Alana to uh, bring uh, Dr. Kellogg here today. Uh, Dr. Kellogg is a professor of uh, political science, and she's a political theorist. Um, she teaches and is a researcher at U of A in Edmonton, the University of Alberta. She's also the chair of her department, and I think a bit overwhelmed now because she just took on the chairship uh, in September. Uh, so we're very lucky to have her here today. In terms of her research, uh, her area is looking currently at um, critical prison uh, studies. Uh, she's working on a book uh, about sovereignty and cruelty. Um, and uh, I guess her previous background was working on law and paper. So with that, please, uh, please help me welcome uh, Dr. Kellogg. Oh, and, and the title of her talk is Persecution and Social Justice. Okay. Thank you, Kat. Thank you. Um, so just so you know, like, hello, thank you for having me, and thank you for organizing this incredibly beautiful weather that, you know, usually I come to Vancouver and I'm like, well, at least we've got the sun in Edmonton, but, you know, we don't have a whole lot. We get the River Valley, we get the sun. Anyway, um, I, just so you know, I'm really happy to take questions throughout, so don't wait for your questions to the end. If you have a question, stick your hand up. I'm super happy um, and comfortable with that. Call me Catherine. It's nice of you to call me Dr. Kelly Michael, but really, it just feels odd. Um, yeah, you can call me Catherine. So yeah, I um, I come relatively late to kind of thinking about prisons. So the, I'll just just to situate myself. Mike just gave a little bit of a bio that was helpful. So the first I did this first very you know abstract work on like you know law and Hegel and deconstruction, and then. Uh, you know, I figured that out, and then I started doing work on human rights, partly because I wanted to think about, um, I wanted to actually teach something students, to be frank, I wanted to teach something that students would take. Um, and so I started teaching human rights and the philosophical foundations of human rights, so I was really interested in how the state uh, is central in protecting people from uh, certain violences. And from there, I actually started to think about how the state is active in producing violences, in being the actual giver of um, pain to its citizens. So <clears throat> I come to prison work through a kind of strange itinerary. Um, so when I started to think about prison work, I'm like, I'm actually kind of a philosopher pretending to be a social scientist. Um, so I didn't really know how to do that. So I decided, I, probably through talking to Mike, I decided I would undertake the inside out prison training, uh, the inside out prison exchange training. So I did that uh, about a year and a half ago. And I went and spent a week in Philadelphia uh, in a men's maximum security prison. I mean, I wasn't staying there, but you know, we, for those of you who know about inside out, that's kind of how it works. Uh, how many of you know about the inside out prison exchange? We just talked about it today. You just talked about it today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, you, so, yeah. you did, you did turn to yeah. grade for two. To, okay, so that's where I was. Yeah. I was a grade for prison. And it was a really, for me, eye-opening experience in lots of ways. Happy to talk about that if you want. Um, I learned more about teaching in that week than I had learned in 20 years of being a teacher before that. Like, I learned so much about teaching. I don't know that I'm always implementing it, but I, I learned a lot about teaching. So, um, why am I here? So I'm part of this, of this network, which is called Prison Teaching and Social Justice. Um, and it was sort of happenstance. So there were a bunch of us at the University of Alberta who just kind of found out about each other. So I said, oh, I'm going to do this, this Inside Out Prison Exchange program, the teaching. 
uh, training rather, and I found out about a colleague of mine in philosophy who was also gonna thinking about doing that. Another colleague of mine who was actually a friend of mine who was teaching in English and film studies who over a dinner party said, oh yeah, I'm teaching a poetry class at the Remand Center. And I said, what? And so we started to discover that across, not just the Faculty of Arts, but in fact then also in the Faculty of Native Studies, the Faculty of Education, there were a bunch of us who were all sort of interested in trying to think about prisons critically, and especially prison teaching. So we thought, oh, I think we might be a network. And there might be more people. So it was, it was actually kind of as casual as that. Then, because we started ourselves as a network, more of us started doing the, the inside out um, training. And then some of us also did the Walls to Bridges training. And we had some very interesting conversations within my, the, 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 the research network that I'm a part of. But the difference between the Walls to Bridges and the inside out training. Uh, so if you ever want to talk about that, we can talk about that as well. Just I'm just flagging stuff that you might want to talk about. Um, and then we discovered that those of us who were become kind of independently interested in hyper-racialized incarceration and mass incarceration in Canada were starting to teach about it to our undergraduate classes. And then the students from across the Faculty of Arts started taking our classes and talking to each other about what they were doing and we discovered, oh, students are kind of really interested in these problems and questions and are willing to read very difficult work because they're so interested in it. In it. So then we were like, we, were inter we, were, we became interested in students' interest. So I'm also interested in your interest in this topic. I'm always interested in why people are interested in the things they're interested in. Um, so we began, we've, we've grown since then, but we began as seven faculty members, so I'll just list it in there. Chloe Taylor, myself, and Kathy Binhammer from Arts, uh, Tracy Bear and Nancy von Seidel from the Faculty of Native Studies, uh, and Diane Conrad from Education. So we had representation from across a bunch of faculties, which was interesting. And we had then also six collaborators who just, that's who we were able to gather in about, I'd say about six weeks, we sort of came together. And we thought, okay, well, we've got, these, these are the people we've got, so what do we do? So we decided that we were going to try and think about what it meant to build a, net, a research network of people at the University of Alberta. That was our first, we were like, first of all, let's get ourselves organized here. And then let's try and connect with people in the rest of Canada who are interested. And that's part of why I'm here today. I want to see if there's interest here in, in making collaborations between what we're doing and um, what you might be doing here. And we were, we were really clear that we wanted to think about prison teaching and prisons in general from a decarceral and decolonial perspective. So both of those are really central to the, 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 the mandate that we set for ourselves. And because so many of us were either starting prison teaching or involved in prison teaching, we wanted to create a space for each other to talk about what it means to teach in prison. Because we all have been teaching in universities for a long time, but we, lots of us were new to teaching in prison. So then we, we put, had some other goals, which was, we want, we, and we're still working on these ones. Um, we're, we're gonna, we wanted to, we wanted to do some published work with, with some of the prisoners that we have come in contact with. The first one that we wanted to do was a cookbook, and I'm happy to talk to you about the project for the that actually came from the, the students that we were working with who were telling us about how happy they were with what they were able to do with the really crappy food that they were given and the amazing things that they can turn it into that's actually sort of tastes like something. <laughs> so we were like, that's the coolest thing ever. So let's write a cookbook together. The students were really excited. So that's ongoing. Um, and there's an art project that is happening with, at the Remand Center and there's plans for an exhibit, I think sometime in the spring. Now we wanted to produce research in critical prison studies, but we kind of just said that on the ground. We're not sure we're gonna do that. 
So we, we wrote a grant. What do, we, what do a group of academics do when they get together and they find themselves <laughs> in a research where they're like, well, let's get money. <laughs> so we were really clear that mostly what we wanted money for was to pay graduate students who were going to be working with us and to get um, uh, 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 supplies and whatever we might need for people on the inside. So um, some of us were, are, were, have been teaching at Fort Saskatchewan, which is a, a correctional facility just outside of Edmonton. Um, it's a me I'm going to talk about a little bit about it in a second. Minimum, medium, high. Come on in, there's food. You should eat. I don't know if there's spaces to sit. There are, actually. Just squeeze yourselves in. Some of us were teaching at the Edmund Institution for Women, which is a women's uh, 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 social security prison. Some are teaching at the Remand Center. So we meet as a research network, we meet monthly. So we started, as I said, as seven faculty members and about six collaborators, some from uh, the Greater Edmonton Library Association, from Gila. Um, and then other librarians, so you probably know about the, the links between, the historical links between social justice work and librarians. If you don't, you should find out about it. It's very interesting. So much of the work that has been done at Edmonton in the last 30 years around prisons, uh, prison social justice, especially at the Women's Institute, has been done with librarians who are interested in social justice and literacy. Um, but that, that group, so that group keeps expanding. We meet monthly, and every time I go to that group, there's more people there. So now we've got maybe 15 to 20 people who come regularly to these monthly meetings. And what we do is basically talk about what we're doing together, and often we'll, we'll choose a reading, and then we'll read something together about what, what are we trying to keep ourselves focused on what we're doing. Oh, I said the thing about the so we're planning a symposium on critical prison studies for next fall at the BAM Center, um, uh, which is part of uh, Campus Alberta. We're always happy to say that. We do have to live in Edmonton, but we do have access to the BAM Center. It's beautiful, um, and we're, we're going to have a symposium there uh, next fall. Are you going to have people with lived experience? Yes. Yes. There will be prisoners there, and probably uh, people who have served. So I want to talk to you, so now I'll just talk a little bit about what my, in fact, my, my, what I have done. Um, so I kind of came into a group that was called the Philosophy Club that started at uh, Fort Saskatchewan uh, Correctional uh, Facility. And it ran pretty much weekly from May 17th, May 2017 till July 2018. Doesn't matter, I just put down the names, but. It's, it, was, it, was, it was Chloe Taylor who was the person who kind of wrote the, our original grant and is really the, the force between a lot of what we're doing in the research network. Um, she really started the philosophy club. Before she'd done any training about how to teach in prison, she just decided, let's just go. And so she just took it. She teaches in general with studies and she took a bunch of graduate students from the master's program in social justice and gender studies. Uh, along with her, and they just figured out what they were doing. It was really quite amazing. And so after about six months that she'd been there, I kind of jumped in, and she was getting tired. She was doing many other things. So I started uh, going every week. And usually there's about three graduate students who come and uh, who came and accompanied, accompanied us to the prison, probably because neither Chloe nor I really drive, <laughs> to be frank. So that was a hilarious thing. We're like, we're going to this prison, which is on the outskirts of the city, and we're like, I wonder how we get there. <laughs> I guess we'll hire some graduate students. No, it's not really that. So they came, and they were great. The grad students have been fantastic. So, and we read a lot of different things, and I'm happy to talk to you about what we read and why we chose what we read as well. It was pretty um, random, but mostly, we try to read stuff that the students asked us about. Um, and then every week, whatever it was that we were reading, we would have to uh, uh, provide to the, to the people who were doing programming. 
at the prison, which is organized by Northwest College, and they would vet it. And they never had a problem with anything that we read, but we knew there was some stuff that we couldn't. Uh, we weren't going to bring in Michelle Alexander's. Um, remind me the name. New of Jim Crow. The New Jim Crow. We knew that if we tried to read the New Jim Crow, I don't know if you know the New Jim Crow. Your chem students, I figure you do. I'm looking for looks of recognition. Or Angela Davis. Like, our prison's obsolete. We wanted to read it. We were pretty sure the students would be interested in reading it. We were pretty sure the people in the prison would not be happy about us reading it. We wanted to keep our, our, our project going. So just, I don't know why. I thought I'd show you a picture. It doesn't tell you anything, really, at all about Fort Saskatchewan. Um, how, how long does it take to get there? Approximately. 40 minute drive. Yeah. Which uh, by in, highway. In, in, on the highway. So it's by Edmonton terms is actually pretty far. So it's in the suburbs. So just a few little facts about Port Saskatchewan. It's a relatively new prison. It's actually kind of the space itself is kind of a lot like this. It's not that different. So part of the, uh, you know, because I was sort of a newbie to prison teaching. You're I, saying we teach in a prison. Pardon me? You, no. said, you said it looks like this. Well, I'm not saying that exactly. I'm not saying that exactly. I'm saying there's something about institutions that are built in certain periods of time that look a lot alike. So Greaterford, uh, which is the men's maximum security prison that I was in in Philadelphia, does not look like this at all. So it was a very it was interesting for me to see the difference between this sort of old, kind of pretty run down American men's maximum security prison and contrast it with this other space. It's about 65 acres that actually used to have a, the, the largest prison farm in uh, Canada, uh, which was shut down. There's a long story behind that. It's a mixed facility, which is interesting, both men and women. And a lot of uh, the, uh, the, the prisoners at uh, Fort Saskatchewan are on remand, about 60% of them are on remand, which makes it different. Yeah. So it's a provincial. It is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, even it's a provincial. It's a provincial institution. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so it, it, the, the fact that 60% of the students are on remand makes a big, makes a difference in what happens in the class. There's a real, so I, I thought, of course, as I go into the class for the first couple of times, I thought, oh, this will be interesting to be in a mixed facility with both men and women. Actually, the distinction in the class was no, that was most notable was not between those who were men and who were women, it was actually between those who were on remand and those who were sentenced. So that was really interesting and the students were very open talking with us about the differences that they saw, saw between each other and what it meant for them to be on like remand for two years versus those who were sentenced and could see the light at the end of the tunnel. They knew, they knew what their release date was. So that was very interesting, and it's kind of one of the things I learned. Um, I, I learned a lot doing this teaching. Anyway, this is just uh, just a bit, a bit of a few stats about the indigenous population at the fort. Probably nothing too surprising to you, although of course, as we know, the proportion of indigenous populations relative to non-indigenous populations in prisons, both federal and provincial, just keeps rising. So that's one of the things that one of the things we tried to do when we were choosing readings, because the students said, "Can you give us readings by Indigenous writers?" Oh. We and so we not so we tried to find a little, as many writings as we could that were by Indigenous writers, but also writings by Indigenous writers who were in prison. We tried to choose a lot. We tried to choose a lot of prison writing. Um, and that was really interesting. <laughs> Sometimes the students were like, I could write this better. <laughs> Which is probably, <coughs> hi, come on in. So that's also part of our, our, our focus, right? Our focus as a research network is, we wanted, to, we wanted to keep our view on doing prison teaching as itself social justice. From a decarceral perspective, that is, we're not really keen on the prison system, and a decolonial perspective, which is, 
we're really clear that prisons are a part of a colonial set, set of networks, there's a set of apparatuses. They're central. First, the class didn't fill up immediately. It was, it, most of the, the programming at Fort Saskatchewan um, is non-academic, or it's people who are doing uh, high school upgrading. So this was a very, it was a very, it was the first time there had been kind of folks from the university coming in, teaching class, it's called like the philosophy club. The students were like, what the heck is that? And why would I want to do that? And at first the students who came to the class said, well, they wanted to learn, because it was called the philosophy club. They're like, teach us the classics. Like, but, so they started, they read Plato, I think, a little bit, and uh, maybe some John Stuart Mill, I'm not sure exactly, I wasn't part of that. Then as the club went on over about the, the, that first five or six months, the waiting list for students who wanted to get in got longer and longer. So the conversation in the prison became, this is a full place, and stuff gets interesting here. So at that point, um, uh, I think Chloe and the students and the other people who were leading the class decided to drop a lot of the classical philosophy stuff and bring in things that students ask for. So I know that one of the things that Chloe and uh, her, uh, the, the, folk, the, the students that she was working with, they read The Little Prince. She thought, maybe they wanna, maybe they wanna read like a, like a classical piece of literature. Students loved The Little Prince. They were very interested in that. So they pursued some classical um, uh, uh, literature uh, we read about land and dispossession, which was really interesting. Um, I remember I went in one week and brought in an article that was about uh, graffiti and tagging in cities that led to a very interesting conversation among the students about um, the use of uh, not exactly tagging, but um, murals in, uh, in towns around Alberta where they had grown up. And memories of murals after murals after murals in Lac La Biche, which is north of Edmonton, used to, there used to be, I found this out from students in the class, there used to be murals all over the town that had been done by indigenous artists. And they were all painted over, except one. And so this one student in class talked incredibly poignantly about what it meant for her when all the murals disappeared. So it was just, you know, it's amazing the kinds of things that, the conversations that would come out depending on what we were reading. And mostly we tried to read what students asked for. Lots of times the students wanted to read things like Man's Search for Meaning. So we read a little bit from that. Um, one week I came in and, and brought uh, De Profundus which is uh, the piece that Oscar Wilde wrote when he was in prison. And that was really interesting. Students uh, loved the poetry of that piece and didn't know very much about the background of uh, Oscar Wilde and were interested in what, what they were like. Because uh, do you know Oscar Wilde? Oscar oh. Wilde was a 19th century kind of uh, uh, playwright and, and uh, novelist who was in prison for homosexuality. So the students were very interesting about that. They're like, do you think of that? They're interesting. But that, that had a big impact as well. So the other thing I wanted, to, I thought I would talk about just for a few minutes is the way that the students talked about their experience in the class. And I've been talking to other people and they say, yes, this is a, this is a common experience when you're working with people in prisons. Um, so as, as the time went on and the students came to trust us, especially <coughs> me and, and the graduate students more, they talked about what this class meant for them. And because I would say every week, what do you want to read? Like, we'll and they're like, anything. Bring what you think you want to do. Like, how am I supposed to guess what you want to read? Mm -hmm. Um, but they talked about how this space was neither inside nor outside. Neither inside nor outside. Which I thought was a really uh, interesting 
metaphor. And we'll talk about that in a second. So yeah, oh, we were always attended in that class from by somebody from Northwest College. So Northwest College is a, a, a community college in Edmonton. And one of the things that they do at Northwest College is they work with corrections to provide programming for all of the correctional institutions in the Edmonton area. So we had, we had made a contact with somebody at Northwest College, it was one of those other kind of random contact things, worked out really well. Um, it's part of the reason we were able to get into Fort Saskatchewan and part of the reason folks were able to get into the Edmonton Institution for Women. Um, the Remand Center is another story that was actually much easier to get into, to do some teaching. So there's always somebody from Northwest College in the room, and that's going to become important for the thing I'm going to say in a little bit. So I want to talk about this, this, this experience of being, being either inside or outside, which I learned from the students. Um, there was one class in particular, I remember this really well, with one student looking at me and said, Catherine, you understand everybody in this room is an addict. I hadn't really thought about that. And she said, and we're we're all we're pretty much all sober in here. We like being sober. And we also know when we leave this facility, we're going back to our drug. So there's something funny about being in this room. Because we're sober and we like being sober. The world is strange sober. Um, and they talked really, I thought amazingly poignantly about how the class was neither inside or outside because on the outside, that is when they're released or when they're you know, not in prison, life is pretty exciting. That's how they express, that's how they talked about it. Life is exciting and scary and you know, free. And life on the inside is so boring that they said things that would never be funny on the outside are super funny on the inside. So we had this whole class in which they just basically told me, tried to explain to me what was the difference in the humor on the inside and the outside. It's unbelievably interesting. And I was, at one point, I'm like, I don't get it. Like, tell me. They're like, there's stuff, in, there's stuff that's super funny in here that we're not gonna, we're not actually gonna tell you. I'm like, why not? I'm like, no, it's super sketchy. Like, we're, not, we're actually not gonna tell you. So it was very interesting. They're like, and stuff that we, we might find hilarious in here, never funny on the outside. So I found that really, really interesting. Um, they also talked about how, you know, it's one of the only hour, couple of hours in their week when they're not completely surveilled in every single moment. Then they can actually talk freely with each other and um, uh, about what's in their minds. Can I just ask, yeah. were these courses uh, credit or no. non-credit? Non this, no, this is a non-credit class. That's why we called it Philosophy Club. Thank yeah. you. It's a good okay. question. An important, actually. Um, so in July 2018, the Fort, uh, the, that is Fort Saskatchewan, shut our group down, shut down our club. With Lisa Prince, who runs the Humanities 101 group at the University of Alberta. I don't know if you know about Humanities 101. Some of you do, some of you don't. It's a project that runs across Canada. It's a project that's trying to um, provide university experiences for people for whom that's often difficult. So the Humanities 101 class has been running at, in, at University of Alberta for, I think, seven or eight years. Don't quote me on that. Um, and Lisa Prince has been running it for at least five. Lisa is a, a, a marvel of energy. Um, and uh, every week, there's a group of students who um, come in to the university uh, every week. Every student who's registered in HUM 101, in Humanities 101, gets a bus, gets two bus tickets there and back. Everybody gets a one card, which is a, a University of Alberta uh, student card, which gives them access to the library, to being on campus. Um, they get a class, they get dinner, 
Uh, and I've taught a bunch of teaching with Humanities 101 as well. So it's a, it's a fantastic. So Lisa has now joined with Allison and with Tracy Bear and Jennifer Ward, um, who works with Community Teaching and Learning Center at the University of Alberta. Her job title, which I think is hilarious, it's she is the person responsible for indigenizing the university. So it's a big job. <laughs> anyway. So Tracy Bear is also was one of the people who organized that massive online course that was the most the most well attended uh, course I think in the history of MOOCs uh, on Indigenous Canada. If you haven't taken the course, I suggest it. It's fantastic. And so now they're they're, they're they've they've come together uh, to teach uh, Indigenous art at the Eminent Institute for Women. Get through the TAs. Yeah. So sorry, you're saying the office of the are raised the tuition. Yes. Sorry, did I not say that? Oh, That's what we were wondering about. Yes. Yeah. The, course the officer. Sure. Sorry, yes. that was where the question was. The office where the registrar has waived the tuition. Has waived the fees. Yeah. Sorry, that was the question. No, that's <laughs> thank you. So it's, a big, it's a big part of the story. Yeah. So. That's something we never do. It's something you never hear. Yeah. I think Except for the I, first time. And yeah. you know, how, how do we explain it? I mean, I do think it's about, the, the, it's, about indi it's about individuals with will to make things happen. Exactly. It's about individuals with will. And, and, with a certain, and with access to certain kinds of networks of power, yeah. Sorry, for the students on the, uh, from the, are there students from the university taking the courses yes. for credit? Yes. Okay. Yes, so it will be, so Native, the students in Native Studies 362 will have in their class some women, probably yeah. five or six, yeah. from EIW. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. See, and to me, this is the model that I think it could be so powerful here. We already, I already read a project where guys are coming out on ETAs into the community, mm -hmm. and the benefit of them coming here in terms of their feeling safe and supported in a university setting. They're starting to have familiarity, not only with campus, but with people. It is a, it's a beautiful model, but we struggle with, and I know Wendy can speak to this as well, but we struggle with getting, es getting volunteers um, to commit to escorting people right. into the community, especially every week. I right. can imagine that it could be a barrier. Well, it's it, tougher and tougher to even get your training to yeah. become an escort. Yeah. I just, from what I understand from Lisa, they're not having too much trouble. Le they're having less trouble than they thought they would finding volunteers as ETAs. I could imagine that if students got their training to be escorts and also were in the class, they would be a natural fit. They would be a natural the way fit. To, to the uh, university. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had any trouble with the security certificate reviews now? That we've yes. Because we're yeah. really having this big yeah. problem yeah. with people who are getting uh, a massive screening process to volunteer for the art. Yes. A yeah. student that's now like asking their partners and their parents and their actors for the last five years yes. and their credit check. Right. That is it's it's classes I, and sexes yes. to get Of course, it's all it's all yeah. of the above. But it's keeping and yet and yet and yet the list of people from what I understand the list of people who are willing to do this is long enough right now that they're not too worried about having enough people to do this work. Okay. But so I knew there'd be all the questions about things I'm like, here's the thing I'm not doing, other people are doing, and I'm gonna try and represent it as well as I can. Yes. Yeah, I think you just have to critique it too. Is that you know that, that you know excludes marginalized people from volunteering in the system? <coughs> it does. Yeah. And totally does. And you know, well, this is a brilliant and inspired model and part of uh, um, you know part of a range of things. There are lots of people in the institution who are not going to see the outside life for a very long time. And you know, prison education still has to get its way in, as well as just uh, regular community groups, um, you know, uh, to break that isolation. Yeah, I mean, I think this challenged us. If I could just add on this, yeah. But there's people who've challenged us to say you should stand in solidarity with us because we can't get in anymore. Yeah. So this is joint effort. Is that mm -hmm. joint yeah. effort, folks? Yeah. That that they are really being persecuted by this and targeted. Artists. And it's it's a I mean these are all super complicated questions because of course 
we're, we're trying to do something interesting under conditions that we did not choose and that we would never choose. And so, you know, you have a kind of multi-pronged approach, I think. And that, that, that's the only way I can think of it. But it goes with, within the institutions who do have the dean behind them, yes. has that institutional backing, can advocate to open up or to advocate against the extensive security review process in some way, in a way that would support efforts like joint efforts. That's a that good would idea. Be really meaningful, and it would really help us a lot because this security review process has just come in recently, and it's like it's really old. And, it's, and that's it's actually spreading. a very yeah. that's actually a very useful suggestion, and I will bring that back to my network. Please. I will definitely bring that back to my network. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I wanted to ask as well. Do you have driver volunteers yes. um, who are not in the classes who just stay to join? Or I don't know. What's their... I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Because I assume, like, I'm, I'm, well, I'm just imagining, like, here, for example, like, if we have students who live in Surrey, drive to the FBI and then drive back, like, I'm wondering if, like, there might be people already over in, like, I don't know. I don't. I mean, that's all of these. See, that's what I'm saying. Like, this is why I was a little nervous. I wanted to tell you about this model because I think it's super exciting and interesting. And I know there's a whole bunch of the details. I don't know. Yeah, I'm just like imagining people it. like sitting in the back of the room supervising, or like, how would that work? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the graduate students that you have yes. coming in. You said they're researching what? Critical prison studies or what? So they're doing different things, actually. Okay. So yeah. the, so I, that was earlier. This is the, the graduate students that we were working with. We were working with at the fort. Sure. They're not really involved. In, they're not involved with this this this, okay. this thing at EIW. So the students at the the students who came with us to the fort. Yeah. Um, they're doing different kinds of work. So. They wanted to do this work as their, they're all R, their research assistant ships, right? These yeah. are these are RA ships, um, because they're all kind of interested in this decarceral anti-colonial yeah. perspective. They're not all necessarily doing a master's projects or master's theses that have to do with prisons, right. although some of them are, yeah. right? Some of them are doing. One guy is doing work on like garbage. It sounded super interesting. The history of like how garbage gets d disposed of and. Uh, yeah, they have different. They have different kinds of relationships yeah. to this work. <coughs> so I, I know I'm past noon. I, 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 the, my last slide, I think, was how can we link to you? <laughs> What's well, happening here? And so I don't know how you want to. Yeah, well, maybe this is a natural this. place to uh, maybe solicit some yeah. questions from people who haven't spoken. Yeah. If, if people have a burning question. Because one of the reasons we have Catherine here is uh, not least of which to have a, a small work, workshop after this uh, class to talk about exactly these networks and um, collaborations that we can build. Uh, but we, I think we have time for a couple of questions before we break. Uh, perhaps from... Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about uh, that philosophy Yes. Um, can you give me an example of book that we read? Yeah. It's, I mentioned a couple of, I know we read The Little Prince. Um, we read short, we didn't read books so much as we read short pieces. Uh, and we read a short piece like by Glenn Coulthard on land and dispossession that went really, really well. Um, because it starts kind of with a, with a story, and then kind of theorizes the story in a way that was really interesting. Um, I'm trying to think about all of the things that we read. I mentioned the piece that we read about um, tagging in New York City, which I was surprised at how much the students were interested in that. Sometimes graduate students brought me pieces to read, uh, uh, we read a couple of pieces from the Journal of Prisoners on Prisons. Um, especially, we read one article that was written by a prisoner 
uh, in that article, in that journal, that was about prison teaching and taking a philosophy course. So there was a little bit of a kind of hall of mirrors <laughs> that was happening, but it was interesting. So I was like, this is what somebody else said in a journal about taking a course on philosophy. And they, they didn't like that piece very much, which was interesting. The students were like, nah, I, I don't agree with this perspective. Yeah. Um, did students self-select, like was literacy an issue? It was not. It was not. So your courses could, were adaptable, your classes were adaptable to Absolutely. different levels? Absolutely. So we would say, we would get, we would, we would provide the reading the week before. Okay. Um, and uh, would come into the class always prepared for students who hadn't done the reading or who couldn't do the reading. Um, and that worked out way more easily than I thought it might. Yeah. So you would read a passage together and then deconstruct it? Or yeah, and you know, uh, tr sometimes the students really, it's just like any kind of teaching, sometimes the students really wanted to stay in the text. They were like, no, mm -hmm. here's a passage, read this aloud, this is beautiful, this is poetry. And sometimes they would be like, can I just talk about some other thing that just happened this morning? Mm -hmm. I'd be like, yeah. What's the thing that happened this morning? Oh, OK, now let's talk it's about something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had um, something similar in the institution um, through um, Chaplin. She had two philosophy teachers coming in on Wednesdays, and we would meet in the chapel, and we would do philosophy classes. And instead of readings, we'd use discussion groups yeah. on love, faith, yeah. Truth, different words that are philosophical and, and debatable, and then, and like you said, it, it really came because we started with three girls, me and two other girls, and then all of a sudden at the end we had no not enough room. Like the word spread and so yeah, and then like everybody's like, oh, well, it was philosophy talks, right? And it was so big that they really repeated for two years, and I don't know if it's still going on, but I, when I left, they were still they were going in for a third year. Yeah, well, it, it's part of why I'm so particularly sad that we got shut down over comportment yeah. because this class meant so much to these students. Yeah. And, you know, like, um, the reason they say we were shut down is not the reason we were shut down, probably. So, and uh, I think it's, you know, that's... But if they were looking for a reason to shut us down, I would hate that one. I think. I'm not, I'm not You're sure. not sure? I'm not sure about that. But, um, yeah, just to, just to say, you know, that really important to know the mentality of the prison system and the institution you're dealing with and the people there. But um, you're, you know, just always trying to open things up further and further. And, yeah. and you guys did that. And, you know, some projects, um, <coughs> you know, if you just keep them, keep the, like, following the institution, they stop being the, the same, same effectiveness. And they have they have a short life, but yeah, you see the ripple effects that they have, and um, something else will come in, right? In that very yes, well, in that very last class, I didn't know it was their last class. In that very last class with those students, I remember they get the same student who said, "Are you here to study criminal minds?" Mm -hmm. He said, "Okay," because he was really like, "Okay, I know you well enough now that I feel like I can ask you some questions." Mm -hmm. yeah. and he was one of the
complicated and interesting question that's trying to get at a lot of different things at the same time. So, but the point of that anecdote was to say, we had really produced a lot of trust in that room, and then we never saw them again. We didn't get to say goodbye. Yeah. Dear, are your graduate students, do they have permission to visit the university, or sorry, the university the institution, or are they not permitted to anymore? They do have the permission, and I know that one of the graduate students has gone up okay. to the fort and to visit a couple of the students from our class. Yeah. Okay, so on that note, um, thank you everyone on behalf of the Department of Criminology, thank you on, <laughs> on behalf of the Social Justice Center, thank you. On, on behalf of the uh, Faculty of Arts and Dean Furby who helped fund the talk today, uh, thank you. And also I f forgot to acknowledge that we're on unceded yeah. Coast Salish territory, my apologies. So I think on behalf of all the First Nations, if I can be so bold as to say that. We, th we thank you, and so please join me in thanking uh, Professor Kelly. So we'll have a short five